And I'm going to share tonight on the temptation of Jesus. And we're going to have some ministry time afterwards. So if you need prayer for any reason at all, we're going to have prayer and ministry time. Um, but this is a message that I keep going back to this scripture. It's in Matthew chapter uh, 4. You can turn there. Uh, we'll read it in a minute or two. But I keep going back to Matthew chapter 4, and I feel like the Lord keeps bringing me back there and showing me things that I've never seen before regarding the time when Jesus was tempted by, by Satan in the wilderness. And so I just want to open up this, this scripture. I want to um, read this and then share some things that I feel like God has really put on my heart to share for this, uh, for this evening. So why don't we read it right now first, um, Matthew chapter 4. You can follow along on the screens there. Um, I'm reading from the New King James Version, Steve, just so you know, uh, for the screens, but um, that's all right. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God... Command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now the context of this passage is right at the beginning when Jesus was about to start his earthly ministry. Scripture says that he was about 30 years old. And uh, he was baptized by John the Baptist, like many people were at that time in the Jordan River. And at his baptism, the Holy Spirit descends upon him, as a dove, it says, and rested upon him. And then immediately after, the, the first thing that happens after the Holy Spirit comes upon him, it says that the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the devil for 40 days. And during this time he's fasting. Which means he hasn't eaten anything. For 40 days. And I believe that this scripture. This passage that we read. Can give us some really good insights. Into the schemes of the devil. And the work of the enemy. And some of the temptations that, that we will face. Now. I kind of think of it like this. It's not good to be uh, over-fascinated with the devil, okay? It's not good to be preoccupied with darkness, okay? But the Bible does teach us to not be ignorant of his schemes, okay? And so I kind of see it like this. When I played football, I played football in high school and in college. Before every game, we would watch film, game tape, of the opponent's team, Okay? Because we wanted to see how they operated. We wanted to see what kind of offense and defense they ran. We wanted to see what kind of trick plays they had. We wanted to see what their players were like. How their quarterback was. How their running back was, etc. So we spent some time studying the opponent. Okay? Now, you can't spend all your time studying the opponent. You're in bad shape then. Okay? But this scripture is like game tape. I mean, this is a fascinating scene. It's like game tape, watching how the enemy works. And this is one of the best passages, one of the fullest passages that reveals the work of Satan. There's a couple others that you can look at 
But this is several verses and three specific temptations that I believe are very relevant to us as believers. <clears throat> so, his schemes really don't change a whole lot, if any. Okay? The same way he operated in the Garden of Eden to deceive Adam and Eve is the same way he tried to trip up Jesus, is the same way he's going to try to trip up us. Okay? He doesn't really have any new schemes because he really doesn't need them. Enough people are running after his schemes. They're working for many people, unfortunately. But I think as we look through some of these things, it's going to expose some of his work and reveal ways that we can overcome. Okay? So first, I want to just quickly go through a progression of these three. And then we're going to focus on the first one for a little bit. But I find it interesting that in each of these three temptations... Satan made an appeal to something different each time. I saw this for the first time a couple months ago when I was reading over this and I was just kind of meditating on it. He made, see, his goal was to get Jesus to follow after him, to obey what he said, okay? So he had to find some way to hook him. He had to find some sort of appeal to try to make, okay? And so in the first temptation... <clears throat> It says, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Now notice Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. Okay? So Satan appealed to his natural appetite. Okay? Jesus was hungry. It said it right there. And even though he is God, Fully God. He was also fully man. He came in the flesh as a human. He had hunger. And so Satan appealed to his natural appetite. Okay? Now, Jesus did not have a sinful nature. Okay? He didn't have a sinful nature. He, think about this. Think of the significance of this encounter right here. Think of how important it was for Jesus to not give in. The significance. He was the first person to walk the planet since Adam and Eve that did not have a sinful nature. Think about that. That's part of the reason why he was born of a virgin. He, didn't, he was born by the Holy Spirit. He had a human nature, the natural appetites, but the sinful nature that we inherited, the propensity towards sin that, would, that drives us towards sin, he didn't have that. And I believe that got the enemy's attention, okay? I believe that got his attention. Now, <clears throat> so how does this work? The enemy will pull on natural desires that we have, which in and of themselves are good things, okay? For instance, um, the natural desire to be accepted or loved. That's something that all of us have. It's a need. It's a human need. We need to be loved. Okay? So the enemy will play on that to get you to receive it in a way that is not congruent with the will of God for your life. Okay? He'll play on the fact that we all need acceptance, and so he'll give you a little bit of acceptance in a certain way in order to pull you into something else that's going to put you in bondage. Or how about this? The human there's, there's something innate in us as humans that we are created to worship. We are created to worship. All of us have a desire to worship. So he'll take that natural, spiritual thing that was placed inside of us by God, and he'll try to change the object of our worship. Okay? So he'll try to play on those natural desires Appetites, even could be food, okay? It could be uh, the natural sexual drive that is in all of us, okay? Try to, try, to, try to turn it into something that's outside of God's ways, all right? And then he also, with us, you know, we still do battle the sinful nature. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh. And when we come to Christ... You know, by the cross, it's put to death, but Paul makes it clear there's still a, there's still a battle going on there, okay? Between that sinful nature and, um, 
and uh, the Holy Spirit in us. So, um, so the first temptation, he appealed to his natural appetite. And I'm going to talk more about the first temptation later, so I'm going to move on to the second. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In other words, I'm not going to cave into this to fulfill my hunger. I live by the word of God. Okay? But I want you to notice what Satan's second appeal was. In the second temptation, he appealed to the scriptures. Think about this. I noticed something else that I think is significant recently is that he took Jesus to the temple. Did you catch that? It says this, Then the devil, verse 5, took him into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. He changed the setting. That's right. And said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Jesus, guess what? You can quote the scripture. I know the Bible too. I can quote scriptures too. Here, let's go somewhere where you're more comfortable. Let's go to your father's house. Let's go to the holy city. You see, Jesus was able to recognize the devil in various settings. Later on in his ministry, he had to recognize when the enemy was trying to get to him. One time he came through one of his best disciples named Peter. When Jesus was talking about how he was going to have to go to the cross and suffer these things, and Peter said, no, Lord, that, that should never be. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. You see, he was able to recognize the enemy in different forms, in different settings. So listen, now he's at the temple in a religious setting, in a church setting. And Satan appeals to the very word of God for his temptation. He appeals to what Jesus valued, what he quoted, what he believed. Now he took it out of context. See, he took, he took a, a promise of God out of the context and tried to trip him up with it. Good. All right? Now listen. We need the whole counsel of the word of God. Okay? We need the whole counsel of the Word of God. There are people using Scripture to justify all kind of crazy things. I was talking to Donnie yesterday on the way after the airport. I mean, just, there is more confusion just across the, the body of Christ. I mean, there is more confusion, uh, deception, just... Straight out weirdness. I mean, just there's this a lot of stuff. We let's let's put the, we live in interesting times. Okay, let's say that. Okay, but you can you can find a scripture to justify just about anything. Okay, I mean people people use scripture to justify sin. I think I think some people think the only thing Jesus ever said is do not judge. <laughs> Seriously, I think some people think that's the only thing he ever said. And so they say that, well, well, let's not talk about sin. He said, do not judge. Or, okay, in the same sermon, he said, do not judge. He said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. <laughs> so don't tell me he's not serious about sin. All right. People use scripture to justify uh, greed. All the time. Hey, give into my offering. God wants to give you a car. For it is written. Okay? Sowing and reaping. And, and I believe in sowing and reaping. And the verse that Pastor Glenn quoted. Give and it shall be given. But that scripture can be used to manipulate and play on people's greed. And it happens all the time. Using a scripture to, to trip us up. You see, if the enemy can't get us in carnality, 
If he can't get us by appealing to our natural appetites or our sinful nature, then he's going to shift the game plan and try to get us through the word of God, some, some deviation. Okay? Some things I've even heard recently. I, I saw somebody trying to say, um, using a scripture, saying that the fear of the Lord is an Old Testament concept that doesn't apply to the New Testament. Okay? And quoting a scripture. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, off the top of my head right now, I can think of three scriptures in the New Testament that command us to fear God. Right. I can think of three right now up, up, that are in my mind. One of them is Jesus himself saying it. One's Peter. One's in Hebrews, okay? We're commanded to fear the Lord. Now, we're not, to be, we're not supposed to be afraid of God, like we can't approach him, but there is a reverence and awe. How many people know... The American church needs a little fear of the Lord. Okay? We all do. That's right. We all do. Okay? But people, you know, use scripture to try to, you know, because it just doesn't sound nice or something. I don't know. I don't know why we feel the need to do that. But um, something else I saw that I, I thought was interesting, and, and a lot of times there's a measure of truth. But um, just something I thought was interesting was um, something along these lines that, you know, we don't need to set aside time to be with God, like to pray, because God's always with us. We're, we're, we're in union with him. He's always with us. Okay? Now, and I understand God is always with us, and we can talk to him any time. But did Jesus miss that revelation? Okay? I guess he missed that one. It says in Luke that he often withdrew right. to be alone with God. Right. Now, if anyone had union with the Father, it was Jesus. Right. Okay? He said, I and the Father are one. And yet, he set aside time, it says regularly, often. It was his regular practice to get along with God. So, little, you know, sometimes it's, sometimes it's little deviations like that that can just kind of, you know, maybe throw us off a little bit. And then there's some stuff that, that goes and takes us out of Christianity altogether. I saw something on YouTube with some uh, lady who was trying to use scripture to say that the Holy Spirit is a female. <laughs> Craziness, okay? The Holy Spirit's a woman, okay? I mean, just, you can find anything. You can find anything and you can find scripture to justify it, okay? Uh, you, can, you, can, you can justify compromise, you can justify unbelief, anything. So be careful. We need the whole counsel of God. Amen. Satan brings this thing to Jesus and says, it is written. Jesus, look, it's the promise. It is written. And it's like Jesus is going through the word. You know, he's, he's going through the whole counsel. And he says, oh, but it is also written. It is also written. Does it line up with the whole counsel of the word of God? We need the whole counsel of God. We need the Word and the Spirit together. We need the Word and the Spirit together. You see um, New Age mixture entering in. And Scripture is being used for that. Okay? I mean, a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. Um, let's move to the third one. Now... This, I, I, this was something that was new to me recently, too. Is that in this third temptation, he says this. It says, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. Again, he changed the scenery. Showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. What was he going to give him? All the kingdoms of the world and their glory. What was he appealing to? First he appealed to the natural appetite. Then he appealed to scripture. This time he was appealing to Jesus' prophetic destiny. That's good. That's right. Now, let me show you what I mean. Revelation 11.15. Revelation 11.15. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. What did Satan offer him? The kingdoms of this world. 
what is, what, what, what's, what's the destiny of Jesus? The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. He offered him the very thing that Jesus was destined for. He offered him a shortcut to his destiny. He offered him fulfillment of his destiny that would bypass God's process of getting there. Which included the cross. Now, I don't think, because Satan's not all-knowing, he doesn't know everything, uh, scripture actually indicates that he didn't really know. He didn't know that the cross was going to be his defeat. So he, he, he didn't know everything. But I guarantee you, he knew that the way Jesus was going to get what he came for was not to worship him. Okay? But I think that was more of a temptation to Jesus than the enemy even realized. Because it was offering him what he came for without having to go to the cross. A shortcut. It's not just about doing what you're called to do. Listen, it's not just about doing what you're called to do, but doing what you're called to do in His way. Okay? It's not just about what you're called to do, it's also about why. Why you want to do it. And how. God has ways. God has a process. God has dealings. Okay? And the enemy will tempt us to bypass those dealings. He'll tempt us to bypass the cross that we're to carry. Okay? Now let me give you two examples of, from Scripture. One person who passed this test with flying colors and one who messed it up a little bit. One is David. Okay? David passed this test. Okay? Listen, he got a prophetic word from Samuel, the prophet, saying he would be the next king of Israel. So that was his destiny. He, Samuel called him out of all of his brothers. He was the youngest. Samuel called him from the sheepfold, anointed him with oil, and said, you are the next king of Israel. The Holy Spirit began to come upon him and departed from Saul, who was the current king. Okay? But David did not become king overnight. There was years between receiving that word and the fulfillment of it. How many know he had an opportunity to shorten the process? Saul was chasing, listen, Saul was trying to kill David. Was chasing him down, throwing spears at him. David's running in the caves. And one time, this actually happened twice, but... One time, all of a sudden, David has an opportunity to kill Saul. And his friends even said, the Lord has delivered him into your hands. Look, David, this is your chance. Let's stop all this nonsense. You're supposed to be the king. Remember, you're the king. You're, you're called to be the king. You're anointed to be the king. Saul's days are over. And he was right there with an opportunity to end this madness and this running and this process of being crushed. And he said, I will not lift my hand to strike God's chosen anointed ones. He passed that test. He didn't take a shortcut on the road to fulfilling his destiny. He didn't use his prophetic word in a way that was outside of God's ways or his process. You see, we can use a prophetic word to justify, again, just like we can use scripture, we can use a prophetic word to justify things. Well, this is what I'm called to. So it doesn't matter if I run somebody over on the way or if I go about it this way or that way. 
Because the end justifies the mean. And one of the biggest traps of the enemy is to try to get us to pursue a legitimate end by an illegitimate means. And that's what, he, that's what Satan tempted him with. He offered a legitimate end. The very thing that was promised to Jesus. Legitimate end. But it was an illegitimate way to get there. Okay? I'm telling you. People want uh, salvation without repentance. They want uh, healing without the cross. Peace without righteousness. There is no peace for the wicked, the Lord said. Peace with God without actually the righteousness of Christ. See, legitimate end, good things, but taking a wrong way to get there. All right? Now, so, so David passed that test. Now, here's somebody who stumbled on this one. Abraham. He stumbled on it. He had a word from God. He had a prophetic destiny. You're going to be a father of many nations. And his wife was barren. Sarah couldn't have children. They were old. They were past the years of being able to have children. And so what did they do? They, they, they decided to do it in a way that was not God's way. Sarah said, well, I'm too old. So if we're going to fulfill this word, we've got to figure out some way to do it. Here, take Hagar, my maid, sir, my maid, or whatever, right? And so they had a child through Hagar named Ishmael. But it wasn't God's way. They wanted to fulfill God's word, but not his way. God has ways. The ways of God. And we need to submit to his process. We need to submit to his ways. There's no shortcuts. Listen, the only one offering you a shortcut is the devil, okay? God doesn't offer shortcuts. And he can accelerate things. Don't get me wrong. And each person's destiny is going to be different. It's not, always, it's not going to look the same for everybody. But there are general principles that apply in, in the fulfilling of our calling. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I find... I, I just found it so fascinating when I saw these three things that he tried to, he appealed to a different thing each time. And really, each one was le legitimate in and of itself. The fact that Jesus was hungry, nothing wrong with that. Appealing to the scriptures, we know scriptures are God's word. Appealing to his pr prophetic destiny, he appealed to good things. Okay? So, the last thing I want to do, I want to focus now on that. I want to really zone in on that first temptation because there's some, I think there's some deep things in there. Listen, it's much, much deeper. Satan was not just trying to get Jesus to break his fast. Okay? There, there, there's so much in that little temptation. Okay? Let's look at it again, that first one. <clears throat> In verse uh, 3, now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. He answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now one of the first things that I see in this, of uh, what was this temptation really about, it wasn't just about food, okay? It wasn't about breaking a fast. It wasn't about just trying to get him to eat bread. <clears throat> First thing it was, was it was a temptation to doubt the word of God. Now let me explain that. You back up a couple of verses. The last verse in chapter 3, the event that just previously happened before Jesus went to the wilderness, okay? What had happened? He was baptized. This is uh, Matthew 3.17. Suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The first thing that the enemy did 
was question the last thing that Jesus had just heard. The thing that Jesus had just heard before going into the wilderness was, this is my beloved son. You are my son and you I'm well pleased. That was the most current word that he had from the father. And the first thing the enemy says is, if you are the son of God. You see that? Questioning what God had just said. Doubting the word of God. It's no different than the original temptation in the Garden of Eden. Listen, the first four words recorded in Scripture that Satan said are, did God really say? That's the first four words recorded in Scripture of what Satan said. Did God really say? Trying to mess with the, the belief in the Word of God trying to mess with what God had said, trying to plant a seed of doubt in what God had said. Did God really say, if Satan can mess with our belief in the word of God, he can do a whole lot of damage. That's the foundation. Okay? He can break a window, but when you mess with the foundation, you're in trouble. Okay? The scriptures are the very foundation of our walk. That's right. That's right. So if he can get us to not believe in the scriptures, the Logos word, or, or what God speaks to us, the Rhema, okay? If he, can get, if he can mess with that, he really has us in trouble. So he spends a lot of his effort basically trying to discredit the word of God. And he does it through... A lot of times, just little seeds of doubt, little questions. Okay, it can be, um, a lot of times it's historical questions. Like, oh, do you really think that, you know, Jonah was swallowed by a whale or a great fish? I mean, come on, that, that must be just a legend or something. I mean, that can't be real. I mean, did Moses really split the Red Sea? That's, come on. Jesus multiplied bread? No, that's crazy, Right? Those doctor, I mean, uh, historical questions. Then there's doctrinal questions. How can you say that Jesus is the only way to God? I mean, if God is love, then why would he set it up that way? What about all these other people that don't believe in Jesus or, or who live in a different country, etc.? Doctrinal questions. Or how, why would a loving God create a hell? Theological, doctrinal type questions. And then the third one is moral questions. I mean, come on. Can it really be wrong for two people who really love each other to sleep together even if they're not married? I mean, can that really be wrong? I mean, come on. What's wrong with that? Do you know, I found this out recently. I read it in an article. That was the very thing that took Katy Perry onto the wrong path. You know that? The famous singer. I couldn't sing one of her songs, but I know she's well known. Okay, she's... She is, uh, she is uh, the daughter of a pastor um, and very worldly um, and sensual in her, in her style and everything. That was the very thing that got her off the path was that, well, if I love this guy, then how could it be wrong for me to sleep with him? That was the step that she took that has uh, moved her so far right now. Moral questions. These are huge today. Chick-fil-A, anybody? Yeah. Chick-fil-A just says that they, you know, they stand for traditional marriage and there's an outcry and, you know, all this kind of stuff. I mean, these are big questions that people have. Okay? But at the root of these questions, whether it's the historical, doctrinal, moral... <coughs> At the root of it, though, is an attack on the scriptures, okay? It's an attack on the word of God. That's really what the question is. Is this the word of God or not? Okay? Because if it is, then Jonah was swallowed by a great fish, okay? 
If it is, Jesus did multiply bread. If it is, Jesus is the only way to the Father. If it is, yes, it is wrong for you to sleep with somebody you're not married to. Okay? The question is, are we going to submit to the Word of God, or are we going to stand over it in judgment and pick and choose the things we want to keep and what we don't want to keep? Okay? So, that first temptation, it was a, it was a questioning of the Word of God. It was also a questioning of his identity as the son. If you are the son, I'm not Jesus, I don't know if I believe you're the son of God. I need you to show me. If you are the son of God, questioning his identity. You see, he was secure in his identity as the son. Not only was he armed with scripture, he, he said it is written every time for every temptation. He said it is written. He was also armed with the voice of his father that had just spoken to him. This is my beloved son. He was armed with the voice of his father. And if we're not secure as sons and daughters of God, we can be pulled all over the place. If we do not find our security in simply being a child of God, we can be pulled all over the place. If I find my identity and my security as a preacher, I'm in trouble. If you find it as a business person, whatever it is, not that that's not part of who God made us to be, all right? Different callings. But if we cannot just rest in security as a son or a daughter of God, we can be pulled into different things. And one of those things, which is the next point here, is that it was, so it was doubting the word, questioning his identity, and then proving himself. If we are not secure in our identity as a child of God, we will always be trying to prove ourselves. We'll always be trying to convince other people that we really are special or we really are gifted or spiritual or that we really know the Bible or whatever it is. If we're not secure in our identity as a child of God, insecurity breeds a performance mentality. Insecurity in who we are in the Lord, breeds a performance mentality. That's part of what this temptation was. Jesus, perform something. And he faced this temptation several times in his ministry. Jesus, show us a sign. If you're, if you're the Christ, show us a sign. See, it was the same temptation. Herod, he stood before Herod. Herod wanted to see him do some sort of a sign or but guess what? Jesus never, and with all the miracles he did, all the healings, raising people from the dead, casting out demons, miracles, all these things, but he never did one except at the prompting of his father. He did not respond to the devil, react to him, and he did not respond to man saying, show me a sign. How, I mean, that just kind of blows my mind. They're asking for a sign. I mean, raising someone from the dead wasn't good enough or what? I don't know. I don't know what they were looking for. But, but, but he, didn't re he didn't react like that because he was secure. And if we're not secure, we'll be trying to prove, you know, prove we're, we're spiritual. Prove that we can hear God's voice. Prove that we're anointed. Some of you have probably heard me say something like this, but that's sadly, that is sadly why, or at least one of the reasons why, we have people uh, in ministry that feel the need to push people to the floor so that they can look uh, uh, anointed. I mean, it's true. 
I mean, I believe that God can knock people to the ground, okay? And I've seen the real thing, all right? But how many times, I mean, why else would that be except that they're trying to prove that they, that, that they really have this? It's performance. I have to perform. I have to show, I have to, or how many times do we say, thus saith the Lord, when it was just our own soul? But, but we have to prove that we, that we are a prophet or we, we have the word of God. Instead of just resting. Sometimes the most spiritual thing we could do is this, zip our lips and say nothing. I mean, sometimes that's the most anointed thing we could do. <laughs> is just not say a word. Okay? But when there's insecurity, then there's that, I got to prove myself. I got to show people. Now, and then the next one, this is the last uh, one of these areas before I bring it to a close in a few minutes. Um, it's to misuse the power of God. Okay? It was to misuse the power of God. Jesus, turn this stone into a bread. Oh, so you were anointed with the Holy Spirit. Okay, show me. Turn this and misuse. It's to misuse God's power that Jesus had just been anointed with. It was to use power without authority. In other words, to use the power of God in a way that was not authorized by God. Power without authority is dangerous. Okay? Use the power of God for his own, to fulfill his own uh, gratification. Use the power of God to fill his own hunger, his own need, his own gratification. Okay? Now, when Jesus began his ministry, shortly after this event, he declared what the purpose of his ministry was and what this power that God had given him was for. And if you'll notice, it's, he quote, it's from Isaiah 61. He quoted it in Luke chapter 4. Verses 18 and 19. But he's declaring what the purpose of this anointing is for. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Did you notice that every one of the things that Jesus was anointed to do, the object was somebody else would receive something. Because the Holy Spirit was upon him, the poor would have the gospel preached to them. The brokenhearted would receive healing. The captives would be um, brought liberty. The blind would receive healing. Those who were oppressed would be set free. You see, he was declaring for what purpose God's Spirit came upon him, and none of it had to do with gratifying himself. And so if he was going to turn that, she, the, te he was, the temptation was to uh, misuse God's power for his, own, for his own gain. For his own satisfaction. God doesn't give us his power to fulfill our need for recognition, for instance. That's not why God anoints you with his spirit. So that we can be recognized. Or so that we can feel significant or important, or anything else like that. Now, don't get me wrong. When God uses you to touch somebody, to heal them, to set them free, to bring them to Christ, it, it feels good. Don't get me wrong. But that's not why he gives it to you. That's just a byproduct. Okay? God doesn't give us the Holy Spirit just so we can... You know, get goosebumps. 
Nothing wrong with goosebumps, but, okay, and that's not why he gives it to us. He gives us the Holy Spirit for other people. He gives us the Holy Spirit because there are people around us who desperately need a touch from God. And I'm a little bit uh, concerned that we just, you know, we've turned the gifts of God and the anointing of God into just like an entertainment or something, or some, just some sort of a spectacle or, or some sort of just way to, for me to feel gratified. It's not what it's for. So he was to misuse the power of God. Donnie, if you could come to the keys here. And I guess if the team, I'm not sure if the team, the worship, whole worship team or not, but yeah, I think that the team, worship team. Um, now, why, why did Jesus have to go through this testing? Why did he have to go through all this, all these 40 days plus you know, throughout his whole ministry, the enemy was still trying to, to get to him. Why did he have to go through all this? Why do we have to go through testing and temptation and trials, etc.? Why? Look at Matthew chapter 27. This is the last scripture we'll look at. Matthew 27. <clears throat> I find this very interesting. Verse uh, 39 and 40. Now, now Jesus is on the cross in this scripture. Notice, notice what uh, happens in this scripture. Those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Now listen, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Does that sound familiar? <clears throat> Passing the tests, the temptations, prepare you to fulfill your ultimate destiny. Victory in the wilderness prepares you for faithfulness when it matters the most. This is when it mattered the most. When he's on the cross, and he said himself, don't you think I can't call on my father and he'll send legions of angels and get me out of this? In other words, I have a choice. I can choose to get out of this if I want to. You see, little victories lead to big victories. Little compromises lead to big compromises. I mean, it's one thing to turn a stone in the bread, okay? It's another thing to get off the cross. But it was the same temptation. But because he had already faced it and overcame it, he recognized it. Oh, I, I recognize that voice. I've heard this before. I've been here before. That's why, at least one of the reasons why, we go through temptations the period of testing, the trials, various forms. Because if we can get victory when nobody's watching, you see, nobody was watching Jesus in the wilderness. If we can get victory when nobody's watching, though, we can have victory in other settings when people are watching. If we compromise when nobody's watching, we'll most likely compromise in bigger settings as well. Okay? How many are thankful that, that Jesus overcame? And he showed us how to overcome. And my prayer is that through this study and through looking in some of these things, it'll give some insight into some ways that maybe you've allowed the enemy to, to get at you. And some keys to, uh, 
to breaking free and to walking in, in victory over those areas. And again, did you notice he quoted the scripture every time? It is written. You can't quote something you don't know. Okay? You got to know the word. It's a big part of it. And trust in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to enter into a time of um, worship and ministry, prayer ministry. Before we, uh, before I open the altar for, for ministry, I, I want us to sing through this song. Once you just, if you just kind of sing through the song, um, and just for us to enter in again to God's presence and worship, uh, and declare the power of the name of Jesus. God, we thank you. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for the whole counsel of your word, God, the solid foundation. We thank you, Jesus, that you overcame and that we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, loving not our lives to the death. God, I ask for grace. I ask for grace to be released, God. I ask for your love to be released, for your power to be released right now. God, I ask for you to expose any ways, God, that we are falling prey to these areas. Lord, any way that we're allowing the enemy to prey on our, our natural appetites or our sinful natures, any way that we're even allowing the enemy to, to trip us up by taking scriptures out of their context, God, any way that we're using um, prophetic words we've received, our, our destiny, our calling, but Lord, we haven't submitted it to you. We haven't, we haven't submitted to your ways. We haven't submitted to your process. And we say, God, forgive us. We want to submit to your process. We want to submit to your ways. You are good. You know all things. You are so good. God, I thank you that Satan is defeated. I thank you that the enemy is defeated by the cross, by the resurrection. Jesus, all authority is given unto you. You are seated at the right hand of God. All authority is given to you. And I pray right now a release of your authority in this place. I pray right now a release of the kingdom of God among us right now. God, I pray. Right, right now, I ask for a release of your light to shine, driving away darkness. A release of the power of your Holy Spirit. God, breathe upon your word right now. And so, Father, as we come into this time, as we worship you, as we wait upon you, as we pray and minister, I thank you for confirming your word with power and signs. I thank you for healing, for delivering. I thank you for setting captives free, Lord. We commit this to you. In Jesus' name.